Yeah. Okay, thank you. So today we will look at uh, first order optimization methods, um, basically gradient based. So uh, we look at gradient descent, and uh, basic gradient descent is for unconstrained optima of differentiable functions. We'll look at some examples, uh, actually not of gradient descent, but for the other methods. Subgradient descent is for uh, unconstrained again, but with non-differentiable functions. And uh, look at some examples. And then projected gradient descent. This is for constrained optima. And again, we'll look at uh, a couple of examples. OK, so we begin with uh, gradient descent. Uh, background. We have a function to minimize. And suppose we have x, a known value of x. It is not the solution, but that's, our, that's where we are. And uh, in, during the algorithm, it will be um, a point in um, each iteration. So x is the current value. It's known. And we want to find the minimum, and x star is unknown. So we assume that x star is delta x away from x, which is known. And so we want to find this delta x. OK, so let's do Taylor series expansion around fx star. fx star equals fx plus delta x, which is I'm neglecting all the higher order terms. So what we have is uh, the first and second order terms. OK. Now uh, we need to find delta x so that this expression is minimized. OK. Now we don't have any knowledge of the uh, Jacob, uh, excuse me, the Hessian del squared, the second derivative. OK. What we can do is, what's the simplest assumption? Simplest assumption is uh, make it equal to the identity matrix. But what we do is we replace the Hessian with the identity matrix scaled by some scalar factor alpha. So we assume that this is our Hessian. And we need to keep alpha small. So alpha inverse is large. See, what happens is when alpha is large, then we assume that um, this is something like a parabola, right? It's uh, del x transpose del x is a parabola, right? Um, the curvature of the parabola will be very low when alpha is high. OK, so what happens is we are approximating using a parabola. OK, what will happen is we'll take a long step. The parabola will tell us that, OK, the, uh, if it's a flat, very flat parabola, it will tell us that the um, x star is so far away. OK, now we don't want that because this is just a second order approximation. And moreover, we don't know the value of, uh, we don't have the actual Hessian, correct? So. It's a safe idea to keep alpha small. Then it implies that the parabola, in two dimensions it will be a parabola, it will, it's very steep. OK, so what it means is we are at x. We are very close to x star. In that case, uh, delta x will turn out to be small. OK, so this is what we do. We replace the Hessian with alpha inverse i, where alpha is some small value. OK, so this is uh, the Taylor series expansion again. And we need to find delta x to minimize fx plus x star. Right? We assume that uh, uh, x is delta x away from the minimum. And note that our variable here is what? Delta x. 
not x. x is fixed. We know the numerical value. So delta x is our variable. Okay, so we need to find the minimum of this with respect to delta x. So take the gradient with respect to delta x, okay, and equate it to zero. So this del with respect to delta x of this will be equated to zero, whence differentiate this. Now f of x is a constant with respect to delta x. The gradient del x f of x star is a constant, okay? So this is the variable delta x. This is linear. So you get this, just a transpose of this. And here it's quadratic, delta x transpose delta x, differentiate that you get two. So one over two alpha times two delta x. Sorry, you get two delta x. Okay, so that gives you this is equal to zero. Whence we solve, we get delta x equals negative alpha uh, del x of f of x. This is gradient with respect to x, okay? Whence x star equals, if this is the step we need to take, take uh, then x star equals x minus alpha of the gradient. Okay, so this yields the update rule. During iteration k, we have from the previous iteration a value x k minus one. Okay, and then we find by some means, um, a step size, it's called alpha, okay, and then this is the gradient from the previous uh, iteration, and then we do this update. It's the same thing as this. I replaced x with x sub k minus 1 and x star with x sub k. But then x um, uh, superscript k, not sub, superscript k is not uh, x star, so we again continue, and it's an iterative process until we converge. Okay, so this is the learning or update rule. Okay, so this is the generic gradient descent algorithm. This is what we want to minimize, and so solution at the end of iteration k is this, and alpha k is the step size in the same iteration. So we initialize x superscript zero, some initial guess, that's our starting point, and then um, we uh, have this for loop. Um, this is kind of my notation, obviously you're not going to run until infinite, uh, maybe um, some max iterations, or you can have a condition until uh, the gradient is, norm of the gradient is less than epsilon. Uh, you keep doing this. Okay, so then what we do is find the gradient, g is del f x k minus one, and then we find alpha k, the step size, by some means, and then we apply the step increment. Okay, x k equals x k minus one minus alpha k g. And then here what we do is, again we repeat the process from x k, so we find um, the gradient and take another step in the uh, negative gradient direction and like this until, step by step, until you get to the minimum. Okay, now alpha k, the simplest option is keep it fixed. Instead of computing alpha k each time, just keep a fixed value of alpha. Then all the directions uh, will be um, proportional to the norm of g, of course. Okay, and alpha. I've uh, drawn them using exactly the same length, but uh, the norm of g, the del gradient is changing, so it would get smaller and smaller. Nevertheless, the problem with having a fixed step size alpha is if you keep alpha too small, then you will need a lot, of, a lot of iterations to converge. On the other hand, if you have alpha large enough, then what happens? You might skip the minimum point, x star. Exact line search is, here's what we do. Find g, okay, now 
um, you see the gradient is this dotted line. Okay. Now, depending on the value of alpha, the step side could be uh, less or more. If alpha is very large, the step, step size could be here, right? On the other hand, if alpha is very small, this red line is the uh, step size, okay? Um, the gradient times the step, um, step size alpha. On the other hand, if alpha is small, we would land up somewhere here, okay? Now, what's the optimum value of alpha? What we do is, we find alpha so that this is what we want to minimize, right? F of x k minus 1 minus alpha g. That's what we want to minimize, okay? So, we find the value of alpha for which this is minimized. So, what happens is, the alpha will take us to exactly the point. It doesn't look like this red arrow is tangent to this contour, but it will take us to a point where the uh, red line is exactly tangent. Okay, if you exceed, if uh, alpha increases beyond that value, then what happens? If you look at the contours, this, uh, like, this is the direction of the minimum, right? Uh, if you increase the alpha further, then it will start increasing. The function will start increasing, right? So this is the optimum step size. Okay, now, wait a sec. We are trying to minimize a function, right? And here we have an argument here which is minimization, right? So, what's the catch? The thing is, so this is another minimization we are doing within this big minimization. But the catch is, this is a one directional minimization with respect to a scalar alpha. Okay, it's not with respect to x multidimensional. That's the reason. Okay, so this is a much smaller, uh, computationally uh, less intensive than uh, the big optimization algorithm. So this is gradient descent based on exact line search. There are many other variations. Okay, now what we'll do is subgradient descent. Subgradient descent. Okay, suppose we have a convex differentiable function uh, at uh, x. Okay, now, uh, so take a y. This is the condition for convexity. f of x plus for any y in the domain of f, f of x plus del f transpose y minus x is less than or equal to f y. This is, we've seen this as the condition for convexity. Okay. Now, what if at some x, the function is not differentiable? It's continuous, but not differentiable. In that case, what do we do? In that case, we use g, which is a subgradient of f. Okay. And this is what a uh, definition of G is. So, F is still convex. Um, if for any Y, this condition holds, then G is a subgradient of the function at this point X. And we'll keep it aside. So, now let's look at uh, these things in more details. So, this is when uh, you have a um, differentiable uh, function. So this is x, and uh, this is this uh, red line is um, uh, along uh, the gradient, so it has a slope equal to the gradient in one dimension. Okay, and so this condition is met here, and you've seen this before. F of y will be more than f of x plus slope times y minus x. Okay. And you can see that this gradient is, in fact, satisfies this condition. So it is a subgradient. 
In fact, it'll be the unique subgradient. Okay, so when it's differentiable at x, then we know that the gradient exists and it's the unique subgradient. And you'll see it in pictures. Okay, well, right here, uh, you can see, suppose we choose another slope. Okay, if we increase the slope, what will happen? It'll cut, it'll intersect this uh, plot of f of x at two different points, right? So uh, it won't match this condition anymore, or this condition rather. On the other hand, now here I'm assuming that y is um, on uh, the right side of x, but that might not be the case. So in that case, you can take y on this side, in which case you can uh, extend this red line this side also. Okay, what happens if you decrease the slope? It might intersect on this side somewhere. Okay, so the gradient is um, unique. The subgradient is unique. Okay. Now, suppose uh, we have a situation like this, where at this point x, the function is not differentiable. In that case, the gradient does not exist. Okay. But we can still pick a line g with slope g. In other words, we can find something that will uh, satisfy this condition, and that g will be a subgradient. But that subgradient will not be unique. Okay, we can pick multiple lines. In fact, I can pick a straight horizontal line. This looks like a minimum, right? So I can pick a straight horizontal line, g0, and that would also be a subgradient. Okay, in fact, anything with, you see uh, these two curves, uh, meet at this uh, point where it's non-differentiable, right? So the slope of this left curve is some gradient, and the slope of this right curve is another gradient, okay? So anything in between the, these two will be a subgradient. And I'll give you examples. Okay, so here, this is how we pick our uh, subgradient. It must satisfy this condition. Here, again, uh, this is the point of discontinuity, and this is a subgradient. If you extend this red line on this side, um, this plot stays above this red line. Now, subdifferential. Okay, I told you that the subgradient is not unique when it's not differentiable. Okay, so the set of all subgradients is denoted del f of x, and this is the subdifferential. Subdifferential is the set of all gradients. Okay, and this subdifferential is a convex set. So if g1 and g2 belong to the subdifferential, then a convex combination theta g1 plus 1 minus theta g2 will also belong to the uh, subdifferential. Okay, like I said, um, this, you see the first uh, uppermost red line here, that's a tangent to uh, this curve. And you see this curve here, the lowermost red line here is tangent to this, right? And so anything in between serves as a subgradient. So this whole set of slopes would be the subdifferential. I'm using the word slope and subgradient uh, or gradient interchangeably because it's two dimensional. Okay, so this is the subdifferential uh, in this case. Okay, now. What is the, what is a necessary condition for minima? Okay, the necessary condition is if it's not differentiable, then this is the necessary condition. Zero must belong to the subdifferential. So this horizontal line here serves as a uh, subgradient. In that case, this point is a minimum. 
And since we assume that it's convex, so it's a global minimum. Okay? So this is the necessary condition. In uh, the differentiable case, the necessary condition was the gradient um, of the function would be zero. Here, the sub-differential of the function contains zero. Now here, uh, I've marked uh, the entire sub-differential. Anything here in between uh, these two lines is a sub-differential. And zero is not included in uh, sub-differential. So this is not a minimum here. Okay, it doesn't satisfy this condition. Okay, so here's an example of how to compute the subgradient. I take a simple example first. f of x equals uh, the absolute value of x, one dimension. Okay, so this is uh, the function f of x. Okay, here it's uh, when x is negative, f of x is negative x, right? And therefore, uh, what will be the slope here? Negative 1. On the other hand, when x is strictly greater than 0, then f of x equals x, right? So here the slope is 1. But in between, okay, so here is the sub-differential, okay? Sub-differential is negative 1 when x is strictly less than 0. It is, in fact, the gradient, which is uh, the slope, negative 1. Likewise, when x is strictly greater than 0, its uh, slope is plus 1. So that's our subdifferential. But when x is equal to 0, anything between negative 1 and plus 1 would serve as the sub, um, subgradient. So this whole set is the, um, this interval is the subdifferential. So this is what the subdifferential looks like. So here at this point of discontinuity, uh, not discontinuous, it's uh, non-differentiability, anything between negative 1 and plus 1 is the um, subgradient. Okay? Example 2, max 1 comma x squared. So it's a parabola, but you threshold it at 1. You don't allow the function to go below 1. So this is what the function looks like. Okay. x square. Uh, here it's x square, but it's thresholded at 1. And so the points are when x is plus 1 and when x is negative 1, okay, between those uh, values of x, it's this. 1. f of x is 1. Yeah. In example 1, how the uh, gradient descent will be applied for x Well, we are going to get there. Oh. Okay. So, so this is uh, the subdifferential here. So, derivative um, when x is less than negative 1, it's 2x, right? Um, and uh, when, let's look at the last case, when x is greater than 1, it's again, uh, the derivative of x squared is again 2x. Okay, now when x is exactly equal to minus 1, it's, now what's the slope at minus 1? Using this, this twice x here. It's negative 2, right? So the slope of this curve is negative 2, and the slope of this is 0. It's a horizontal line. So anything between that, negative 2 and 0, will be the uh, subgradient. Okay, that's when x is strictly uh, negative 1. When x is between negative 1 and 1, excluding these two endpoints, negative 1 and 1, okay, strictly between, uh, so the open interval, minus 1 through 1, then What's the slope here? Zero. Correct? And likewise, uh, when x is equal to 1, um, 
this whole 0 to 2, this interval is the subdifferential. Okay, so this is in fact what the um, subgradient uh, looks like. Okay, actually, if you consider this whole thing to be a set at this point um, uh, plus one, then subdifferential. Okay. Okay, here is a little more complicated example. Infinite norm of x, and we take a two-dimensional case. We have x1 and x2 as the two axes. Okay. So, f of x will be max of x, absolute value of x1 and absolute value of x2. Okay. So, we'll examine all these cases to see uh, why these are the subdifferentials. Now, let's look at this. When x1 is greater than 0, and this is when inside this triangle, x2 can be negative or positive, right? x2 here, the y-axis can be positive here or it can be negative 2, but the absolute value of x2 is always less than x1. Note that this is less than, okay, so this 45 degree line is not included in this red. This 45 degree line is not included in this red, okay. So here, what we have is f of x will be the max of these two, right? But given this condition, f of x is equal to x1, x1 being positive. Okay. So, what's the gradient? If f of x is x1, what's the derivative with respect to x1? 1, right? The derivative of f of x, what's the, I'm trying to find the gradient of f of x. So, differentiate with x1, with respect to x1, and then with respect to x2. Derivative of this with respect to x1 is 1. Derivative with respect to x2 is 0. 1, 0. Since um, it's a column vector, that's why I put a transpose here. Okay, so this is the um, subgradient. Okay? And you can see that, you can observe, uh, right, the contours here are vertical lines. So, this is the direction of the gradient. Everywhere here, the direction of the gradient is pointing left. Uh, sorry, pointing right. Okay. Now, let's, before we consider this case, let, uh, where x2 equals x1, and both of them are greater than zero, let's go to the third case. Here, what happens is, um, x2, the absolute value of x2, x2 is positive, right? Here, in this triangle here, x2 is positive, and x1 uh, can be positive or it can be negative, okay? But the numerical value of x1 is always strictly less than x2, okay? So if you take the max, then you get f of x is x2, and what's the derivative with respect to x1, 0, with respect to x2, 1. So 0, 1 is the gradient in this case. Now let's move to this straight line here. This is where x2 equals x1 along this 45 degree line. Okay, and here both of them are positive. So what is f of x? It can be x1, it can be x2, because both of them are equal, right? And what we do is we always take a convex combination of them. So these are the two extreme cases, x1 and x2. Okay, so if you differentiate this one, f of x equals x1, if you differentiate this, you'll get 1, 0. If you differentiate uh, x2, you'll get 0, 1, right? So those give us the two extreme um, ends of the subdifferential. So any value in between 1, 0 and 0, 1 is um, alpha times um, alpha and 1 minus alpha. So we can express this function as 
alpha x1 plus 1 minus alpha x2. Alpha has to be between 0 and 1 because the subdifferential is a convex set, right? So the, we got the two extreme ends, 1, 0, and 0, 1. So everything in between them is alpha 1 minus alpha when uh, alpha is strictly between 0 and 1. So this, for different values of alpha, you get the sub um, gradient, one sub gradient, okay, at this point. And likewise here, f of x uh, can be either negative x1 or x2, and uh, we say it's negative alpha x1 plus 1 minus alpha x2, and here um, 0 is less than x2, which is equal to negative x1 here, x1 is negative, okay? And so this is uh, the generic expression for the subgradient for any alpha between 0 and 1. Are you comfortable with this? Anyone? Okay. So I hope you understand this one. Uh, this is a two-dimensional example. Anyway, so this is the subgradient method. Okay. So uh, here's what we have. Uh, this is x, and uh, we take. Uh, uh, the negative subgradient, we find a subgradient and take the direction of the negative subgradient. And this looks pretty much like uh, our original uh, gradient descent algorithm, except, so we find a subgradient. Uh, this is kind of misleading, but uh, since uh, del uh, of f doesn't really exist, but um, treat this as finding the any subgradient. Okay, this step. Then we find an alpha as before, and we take the direction of the uh, negative subgradient. Now, the additional step is this one. Because we are employing subgradient, I'll show you an example, we might overshoot. Okay. So, we store an x min in memory, so initialize it to x naught, okay? And then every iteration, if we hit a smaller, a point that's smaller than x min, um, f of x k, if it's smaller than f of x min, then that's our new value of x min, x k, okay? Take the one which is smaller, x k or x min, which yields a smaller value of f. This is the additional step. So we need to store the minimum. Okay, so here is an example of applying the subgradient method. Now this is, um, so what we have is AI transpose X plus BI, I, I. Okay, so we have multiple straight lines if um, considering a scalar X, so we have multiple straight lines like this for different um, AI and BI, A1, B1, A2, B2, A3, B3, A4, B4, whatever, okay? And so we're taking the max, at each point, we're taking the max of all of these, and that is the function f of x. So this is the function, okay? And you can see that at all these intersections, it's not differentiable. Okay, so the gradient in general at any of these points, not an intersection, okay? At any point, so what is the gradient at this point, let's say, at this point, what's the gradient? This slope, right? So whatever is the highest, if I, argmax arg of, uh, with respect to the index, 
this AI and BI produce the highest of AI transpose X plus BI, then G is this slope AI. Okay. Now, suppose this is XK minus 1. Okay. This is, uh, we find, uh, this is the subgradient, but in this case, it will be simply AI for this I. Okay, and we take a direct, um, step along this uh, subgradient direction and we get to XK. Note one thing here, now it's no longer the function, right? So, this is why we need to keep it in memory, okay? So, here what happens is we have xk and uh, the value of the function is actually this. So, from here, this is the value of the function and then the gradient obviously will be different. It will be uh, the ai corresponding to this, this line here. Okay, and we take a step along AI again, and we get XK plus 1. And then, again, now it's uh, this point, correct? Or maybe it's the intersection between these two points. In which case, we'll have to compute the subdifferential. Okay, so that's the, uh, how you apply gradient descent here. Um, any questions? Uh, like an example. Yeah, that's uh, in this. Uh, the question is that uh, at the point of this continuity where the differential is does not exist, how this optimization then works? Gradient descent. Uh, for this property. Yes. That's a good point um, because of this property here. This property. So, y minus x is the direction of the step. Okay. okay. And so we take a, um, so this gives us delta x. So if we take uh, the negative g direction, we're going to minimize. Was that clear? Okay. So, this is example four, and uh, the only difference is uh, we have to store this x minus each time. Okay, next is projected gradient descent. This is when you have a feasible region. Okay, so it's a constrained optimum problem. So, we assume that uh, it's not the whole um, um, uh, n-dimensional uh, Euclidean space which is uh, feasible, only a, a region is feasible and outside it's infeasible. So the projection of a point Y is a point X projection of a point Y is a point X, okay, such that the norm of Y minus X is minimum. And X belongs to uh, this feasible region. So we have to find a feasible uh, point X that's at the, uh, that's uh, closest to Y. So this is, let's say, the feasible region. And so this is y. OK, this is the point y. And so this is the projection of y on the feasible set. So it's this point x. And this is the minimum uh, value of this norm. So this is orthogonal if you are looking at one dimension two dimensions here. This is orthogonal. 
Okay. So this is the projection of a point y uh, on f. And so what we do is, this again is very similar to gradient descent, but here's uh, additional step. So what we do is, uh, here, uh, oh, I missed a step here, uh, find the direction of the gradient. Okay, sorry about that. So uh, there's a step here missing, find g. Okay, then we find um, alpha, and uh, then we take a direction but this x k minus one might not be feasible, right? Oh, sorry, when we take a direction, so the x k minus one is the previous step. Um, so y might not be feasible, right? So we then take the projection of y um, on f, the feasible region. So this shaded region here, which is the left of this uh, red curve, is the feasible region. Okay, so here is x k minus one. And this, so uh, these are the contours of the function, level sets of the function. So this is the direction of the gradient, right, along this blue line, blue dotted line. So we take a step along the gradient, we land up here, which is outside the feasible region, and then we project y back onto the feasible region here. And here, again, we have to take the gradient. Uh, it's a direction orthogonal to this contour here. So this is the direction. We get to another y and then project it back to the feasible region. So this is xk plus 1. And we continue this process until we hit the uh, global minimum. Sorry, not the global minimum, but the constraint minimum, x star. OK. And there's a convergence proof that it will work. Okay, here is a simple example of a projection. Projection onto a unit circle. Okay, so suppose um, this is um, x. Actually, I swapped the uh, x symbols, x and y. So y is a projection of x here, okay? So uh, this and the next example also, um, I've swapped um, x and y. In the previous case, what we had was x is a projection of y, and here y is a projection of x, okay, in these two examples. So this is one example. So we have a point x, okay, and uh, we have a unit circle here, and the feasible uh, region is this uh, unit circle, okay. So now, suppose we are, uh, we are to maximize f of x equals half x transpose qx for some q. q is positive definite, so we have some minimum. Okay. This is what we want to minimize, but with the requirement that norm of x has to be 1. Okay. So we start from some x, and what we do is apply the gradient descent algorithm, or the projection, uh, projected gradient descent. So uh, first, let's find out what's the projection of x. Take any point x. The projection of x is simply x divided by norm of x. That's the only thing to make this one, right? From geometry, uh, from common sense, uh, the projection of any point x is x divided by norm of x. OK. What happened? Uh, the cursor is not moving. Oh, battery down. Oh, battery down. Oh, no. The light turned off. OK. So fixed step size alpha will take. And so this is the direction of the gradient of this function. OK. So y equals xk minus 1 minus gradient uh, minus alpha times gradient xk minus 1. Correct? This is uh, q um, xk minus 1 is the gradient. Okay, which is equal to i minus alpha q whole xk minus 1. Okay, so this is y here. Oops, here I've swapped the points um, y, and then xk will be 
y divided by norm of y, right? y divided by norm of y. Okay, so this gives us uh, how to apply the gradient descent algorithm here, or projected gradient algorithm. This is the step. In the kth iteration, this is what we apply, okay? Here is another example, projection onto a hyperplane. So we have, this is a hyperplane, okay? Now, um, this A, this direction A, is orthogonal to the hyperplane, which means that the equation for this hyperplane is A transpose X equals B, where B is, if this is a unit vector, then B will be the length from the origin to this point, okay? So this is, uh, this line is, uh, going right through this hyperplane, okay? Now, A transpose here is one row vector. This is three dimensions, okay? The projection could be just a plane, like in this case. How do you define a line in uh, 3D as the intersection of two hyperplanes, okay? So maybe the feasible region would be a straight line, not um, a hyperplane A transpose X equals B, okay? If it's a straight line, then it has to be the intersection of two different hyperplanes. So we have to have two different uh, A transpose and uh, B here, okay? So in general, this is N minus one dimensional, right? So we can, uh, if we define two of these hyperplanes, okay, and we say that the intersection is uh, the region, then um, uh, we, we have uh, the straight line is uh, one dimensions, right? So with two hyperplanes, we are reducing the dimension uh, further to one dimension, okay? In general, if you have N dimensions, Okay, then the hyperplane would be, a single hyperplane like this would be n minus one dimension. But you can define multi, the intersection of multiple hyperplanes, up to n minus one hyperplanes. Okay, until you get a point. Okay, so in general, A x equals B, where A is a matrix, and each A transpose uh, would be a row of this A. And here, each element of B would be one of these scalar Bs, okay? And what's the rank of this? So what's the number of rows of A? Number of columns would be equal to N, right? Uh, X is N dimensions. The number of rows would be up to N minus one. So it's a, in general, it's a wide matrix. Okay, remember this. So in general, uh, this is for um, uh, when A is simply a um, uh, row uh, vector, which is A transpose, but in general, A could be a matrix, but uh, it would be a wide matrix. Okay, otherwise, if you have uh, more than that number of hyperplanes defined, they might not intersect. Okay. So, uh, what do we do in this case? We want to, so this is a y given to us. We want to project it onto this x here. So, we want to find an x, given a y, we want to find an x such that the distance between y and x is minimized, but with x satisfying this condition, a x equals b. Now, instead of minimizing just the uh, norm, I'll minimize the uh, norm squared, which is nothing but minimizing this, y minus x transpose y minus x with respect to x, but a x must be equal to b. So this is what we have the problem. 
Now, this defines a constrained optimization problem. Okay, we want to minimize this quadratic, y minus x transpose y minus x. Actually, I just put a half here for convenience, such that ax minus b equals zero. Construct the Lagrangian, so I just opened this. This is the Lagrangian, and then uh, this is a mu transpose. This is an equality constraint. So ax minus b is an equality constraint. Mu transpose ax minus b I have here. Differentiate this with respect to um, x. What do we have? Well, this is fixed, right? Y transpose y. So this is uh, not a function of x. It disappears. This becomes... Uh, oh, uh, two and a half cancel, so it becomes y, and then half, and this becomes twice x, so the, uh, you get x here with, why is this negative? Oh, y minus. Oh, uh, uh, differentiate with respect to So um, I just swapped. Um, the signs should be, this should be negative, this should be positive. It doesn't make a difference. Okay. Um, the Lagrangian, I'm not saying here whether it's, uh, I'm from minimizing or maximizing. Okay. So, the, so we can just take the negative of this here. And then uh, place a negative sign here. Doesn't matter. Okay. We, it's just a first order condition. And so we differentiate this. We get this. Um, a transpose mu here, and then uh, that should be equal to zero. And so x equals y minus a transpose mu is our solution. Okay, but we don't know the value of mu. Pre-multiplying both sides with a, ax equals a y minus a a transpose mu. But ax equals b, correct? So we have eliminated uh, x. So b equals ay minus aa transpose mu. Note that aa transpose will be a, a full rank matrix, but not a transpose a. Whence we have aa transpose mu equals ay minus b or mu equals a transpose inverse a y minus b. Now we have the value of mu. So x equals y minus a transpose mu, which is given by this expression. So x equals this. Given y, you project it um, y onto this a x equals b. And so this is the expression you get. And simplifying further, it's this. Okay. So, this is the expression for the projection. Where P is given by this. What is this? A transpose A A inverse. A A, A, A transpose inverse. Pseudo inverse, right? Yeah. Okay, so this is the expression for the, uh, P here. P is called the projection matrix. What would P square be? It would be P. Okay, now think of it this way. If you x is already on uh, this point, ax equals b. If you, if you don't know that x is on ax equals b and you apply the formula again, the point wouldn't change, right? It's already on um, ax equals b. Okay. So if you repeatedly apply this, uh, the first time you would get a new point. Uh, but then it would yield the same point. Okay?
Now, why p square would be equal to p is because just uh, take a special case with b equals 0. Okay, so that's where we are. Any questions with this? Yeah, I messed up the this part. There is another question. Uh, it is asked from the lecture notes. Like when we decide that we need to take plus mu or minus mu, the Lagrangian variable. Since it's unbounded, it's free. You can take any value. Plus mu or minus mu. It doesn't make a difference. I, I could have just made this negative, minus. Still, it, won't make. it won't make a difference anywhere. Okay. But inequality constraints, we have to take care of the signs, right? For the lambda. For the lambda, yeah. Not For lambda, it depends. If you want to maximize, mm -hmm. then I told that to you in the slides what to do. If it's just a maximization problem, then you can replace lambda with negative lambda, either that or say that you can still have in the Lagrangian plus lambda, but uh, um, with lambda less than or equal to zero. If I have a greater than equal to constraint, take the negative of that, it becomes a less than equal to constraint. Okay, then, uh, any questions pertaining to the slides? Okay, so then we will end today's uh, lecture. So uh, if you want to...